Welcome, and thank you for standing by. At this time, all participants are listening to your own mode into the question and answer session of today's conference. At that time, you may press star 1 on your phone to ask a question. I'd like to inform all parties, today's conference is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. I would now like to turn the conference over to Maria. Thank you. You may begin. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Maria Olmedo Malagon, and I'm the Chief of the Office of Strategic Alliances at the Census Bureau. Today, we release a new report showing how the Centennial Census Program's data help guide trillions of dollars in federal funding distribution. This is the first new estimate we have released in nearly six years. This new figure underscores the importance of the Centennial Census Program's data and how our data serves as a critical source of information to help guide a variety of organizations to distribute federal funding for hundreds of assistance programs. Before I introduce today's speakers, I want to thank and acknowledge you, all of the data users and stakeholders listening to today's webinar, who help amplify our message about how just how important it is for everyone to respond to the Senior Census and Census Bureau survey. Today, we have three speakers who will walk you all through how the Census Bureau arrived at this new estimate and what it means. Speaking today will be of Albert Fontenot, who is Executive Senior Advisor for the Senior Census Programs here at the Census Bureau, Ceci Villa Ross, Special Assistant to the Division Chief in the American Community Survey Office. Ms. Villa Ross will be delivering today's main presentation and is the Census Bureau expert on how our data informs federal funding, and Professor Andrew Riemann from the George Washington Institute of Public Policy at George Washington University. Professor Riemer is a nationally recognized authority on the topic of today's webinar and collaborated with us on this new report. Immediately following today's presentation, we'll start taking questions from the audience. If you are ready, have a question and are dialed into the phone line, you can get into the question queue now by pressing star one. We begin today's presentation with Al Fontenot. Al, welcome. Thank you, Maria. Earlier today, we announced that more than $2.8 trillion in federal funding was distributed in fiscal year 2021, guided by Census Bureau data in whole or in part. Our previous estimate, released in 2017, was more than $675 billion. You will hear more about how we arrived at the new estimate, our methodology, in just a few minutes. The new figure of $2.8 trillion represents not only the power of census data, but perhaps more importantly, the power of people's responses to the once-a-decade count and to our survey. Quite simply, people power our data. Every person who fills out a questionnaire helps provide a vital part of the picture of their community and ultimately the country. People's responses also help guide where federal funding flows. People's participation improves the quality of the data we collect and the decisions that send money back to their community for the things we all care about. Knowing the amount of federal money guided by census data underscores the significance of people's response and our work to constantly improve the timeliness and range of data products we provide. Calculating dollar figures for every federal program that census data touch is a complicated and labor-intensive task. Bessie Villa Ross from the American Community Survey Office, our resident specialist on how census data informs federal funding, collaborated with Professor Andrew Reber, a nationally recognized expert on this subject. Professor Reamer provided valuable input on the methodology used in this new report from his years of research. We are thankful to Ms. Villa Ross and Professor Reamer for their hard work on this project. Without further ado, I would like to introduce Professor Reamer to share his thoughts on today's release. Professor Reamer? Hello, Alan. Thank you. And thanks to uh, Ceci and everyone involved in this uh, very important project. 
it's a thrill and an honor to work with the Census Bureau on this. As, as people, uh, many people listening know and watching know that uh, in 2019, I came out with a report that identified 316 federal programs that allocated $1.5 trillion in fiscal year 2017 um, to communities around, around the nation. And that in addition, the, the census data uh, were identified as guiding day-to-day -day investment decisions in economic activity across the U.S. The new report uh, expands greatly on that, almost doubles that figure, and makes even more clear the substantial importance of census data in evidence-based policymaking and in having a healthy economy. Uh, also, I, in the report, we um, link the current efforts to allocate federal funding, $2.8 trillion, to an idea that James Madison had on the floor of the House in 1790 in designing the very first census in which he said, wouldn't it be a great idea, a really innovative idea, to actually ask people about their own characteristics so that Congress can adapt the public measures to the particular circumstances of the community. And the census, the Samuel census and the Census Bureau have been doing just that for two and a third centuries. Um, this new estimate just makes quite clear the breadth of the impact that everyone filling out their census form has on our communities and our day-to-day -day lives. And the report describes the, the research and the methods that I and Ceci and our colleagues use to come up with this number. Ceci, what was yours? Great. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Al and Maria. Uh, it's great to be here. Um, as an overview, uh, I'll start off by presenting the findings and tables of the top 20 programs as well as the COVID-related programs in fiscal year 2021. Um, after presenting the findings, I will provide the background analysis, scope, and methodology, um, as well as some examples of how programs are using the data and the data sources. Uh, these examples provide a glimpse into how programs are using the data for particular federal assistance programs. So we found that at least 353 federal assistance programs use Census Bureau's data in whole or in part to distribute federal funds in fiscal year 2021, which is estimated at more than $2.8 trillion in federal funds. Um, of these 353 programs, the top 20 largest federally funded programs account for about 90% of the total funds distributed. So this slide here shows um, the top 20 programs from this analysis. Um, though the funding for certain programs has changed relative to spending on other programs, uh, many of the other programs from the 2015 analysis uh, are still within the top 20 uh, programs in fiscal year 2021. Um, as you see on the slide, those programs that are in bold are new uh, to are new to the analysis in, tw in for fiscal year 2021. And I think this slide really uh, should resonate with many of us since COVID was uh, something that affected all of us in some way. Uh, this table shows the programs specific to COVID, which were new in fiscal year 21 and account for over 700 billion, uh, and that is about 25% of the total federal assistance in fiscal year 21. So there's a little bit of background on how we got to this estimate. Um, data from the 2020 Census Barriers, Attitudes, and Motivators study showed that funding for public service, services such as hospitals, schools, and roads is a key motivator uh, the report goes on to, to state that, the, that participants might be persuaded of the importance and purpose of the census if they make the connection between completing a census form and the possibility of increased funding or support for their community, notably um, uh, in support of critical community institutions, organizations, and services. Uh, the report goes on to say that this, in turn, um, may boost self-response for the 2020 census. And a simpler way to say all that, um, illustrating the, the value of our data to funding or support for a person's community uh, increases the likelihood of participation in a census or survey. 
So as we were actively preparing for the 2020 census, we released a working paper and found that more than $675 billion in federal funds were distributed in whole or in part using Census Bureau data in fiscal year 2015. This figure has been frequently used to illustrate the value of Census Bureau data to the public to encourage timely uh, survey and census responses. It is important to note um, the Census Bureau does not distribute or determine federal funding for any program, nor does the Census Bureau determine how the data are used by federal programs or in their funding formulas. So as we have said, um, we built on this previous work in partnership uh, um, work that we've done and in partnership with uh, uh, Andrew Reamer, we documented an updated estimate of the allocation of federal funds distributed using decennial census programs data. Federal financial assistance programs use our data to guide funding in one of, of three ways. Uh, programs use the data to define the characteristics of geographic areas, state and local governments, and populations eligible to receive funds. Another way is the programs use um, the data um, as variables in formulas used to determine the allocation of funds to eligible recipients. And several competitive financial assistance programs use data derived by the decennial census program to specify criteria by which the sponsoring agency will rank and select uh, award recipients. And the overall approach is to illustrate at the federal level how the use of decennial census programs data are used in the distribution of funds. Uh, by responding to a Census Bureau survey or the census, the data collected may enable federal programs to fund initiatives by using population counts and characteristics to target and distribute funds, or to provide a tool for data-driven decision-making in government, communities, and, interest, and industry, which really builds um, uh, the confidence in the government and the, and the economy. Um, it also provides a substantial return on investment to the public when considered against the total funds allocated based on these data. So the scope of federal assistance is defined as being distributed using Census Bureau data. In this analysis, the term Census Bureau data is defined to include the decennial census programs data. So that's data produced by the decennial census, the American Community Survey, and ge geographic programs supporting the decennial census and the American Community Survey as well as data produced by programs related to the decennial census programs. Uh, listed here on the screen uh, are the related programs that use decennial census programs data to determine sampling frames, to control and wait for estimates, or as an input. So for example, the Census Bureau's uh, Population Estimates Program produces estimates of the population nationally and for state and county geographies throughout the decade. Um, the, the population estimates program uses measures of population change, um, such as births, deaths, and net migration, and adds this change to the most recent decennial census data to provide annual time series estimates of population and housing units. Uh, these estimates are then used as population controls for the ACS and other federal surveys. So our data sources for the funds estimate were uh, USAspending.gov and the System for Award Management, known as SAM.gov. Uh, USA Spending is the primary source of funds estimates for this analysis. Um, it's maintained by the Department of Treasury and is the official source of U.S. government spending data. Legislation such as the Federal Funding Accountability and Transparency Act and the Digital Accountability and Transparency Act require agencies to share information on federal financial assistance awards of more than $25,000 on a bi-monthly or quarterly basis. Um, I examined spending information for fiscal year 2021 since this was what was uh, the most recently available data when my analysis began. And then information about each program, including whether funding is guided by formulas, is sourced from SAM.gov. 
And SAM DACA is, is a dissemination mechanism for federal domestic assistance program information, and it's maintained by GSA, uh, the General Services Administration. So at times where there was uh, USA spending data were incomplete for a particular program, I would have gone to uh, uh, SAM.gov for the funds estimates. So how did we get to this estimate? Um, this analysis examined the way funding is allocated for a program and if and how Census Bureau data are used. At a very basic level in most of these uses, Census Bureau data either uh, direct either who can receive the funds, mostly states, but could be smaller geographies or individual organizations, or how much they receive. The methodology for this analysis was to uh, start by reviewing the catalog of programs from the 2017 report to ensure they still existed and that they were still providing funds. If the program was still active, the funding amount was updated for that program. Eight programs from the 2017 inventory did not have a fiscal year 20, 2021 funding amount, and this could be because the program was no longer funded or it was inactive. Additionally, um, in partnership with uh, Professor Reamer, the inventory of programs in his Counting for Dollars 2020, the role of the decennial census in geographic distribution of federal funds, his programs were examined for inclusion as well. New this time around, uh, new programs were identified by using uh, machine learning techniques. This involved using Python and open source packages to perform natural language processing. Then modeling techniques such as logistic regression, random forest, and support vector machine learning were used to determine if there were other possible programs that were using Census Bureau data. Then the potential federal programs uh, that were identified were examined in SAM.gov, grants.gov, uh, congressional budget requests, as well as a very robust review of the program authorization to determine if the program uses Census Bureau data in their funds distribution. As a result, 229 programs were added to the inventory of programs with a funding-related Census Bureau data use. The fiscal year 2021 funding for these programs were updated from USA Spending, um, DACAV, again, the official source of federal government spending. For some of the programs, uh, the funding amount was not available in USA Spending, um, and other sources, like I mentioned, SAM.gov, was used, but we also used program websites or budget documents to where the, were used to capture this information. So between the merge methodology from the report that was released in 2017 and Andrew's methodology in um, the Counting for Dollars report, plus inflation or programs passed by Congress over the last few years, as well as the COVID programs, it was natural for us to see an increase in the amount of money allocated by federal programs using data derived from the decennial census program. As I was reviewing various pieces uh, of legislation or program sites, the information I was looking for in making a determination of a program's use of Census Bureau data for their allocations are seen here on the screen. So for the Medical Assistance Program, which is the largest federally funded program, it states from their authorization, the secretary calculates the percentages using formulas in sections 1905B and 11.01A8 and calculations by the Department of Commerce of average income per person in each state and for the nation as a whole. So per capita income is derived from a combination of population and characteristics. The population threshold is used for federal transit formula grants as seen here, population of not less than 50,000, and then it further states that has been defined and designated in the most recent decennial census. For a couple of the COVID assistance programs, unemployment statistics were used to determine the allocation to the state, and the uh, official unemployment statistics are from the current population, population survey, which uses the Census Bureau's master, uh, master address file for the sampling frame. And this is, is, is updated conti continuously by the by decennial census programs, address canvassing, and listing operations. 
In addition to the number of unemployed individuals for the coronavirus state and local recovery, the methodology for the counties and other levels of government, the act required the funds to be allocated based on the population share of the total population using the latest available population data from the Census Bureau. So in summary, more than $2.8 trillion in federal funding was distributed in fiscal year 2021 by programs, by programs using data in whole or in part by decennial census programs. This accounted for 353 federal assistance programs and the top 20 largest federal, federally funded programs account for about 90% of total uh, funding distributed. As Al mentioned earlier, the new figure of $2.8 trillion represents not only the power of our data, but perhaps most importantly, the power of people's responses to our censuses and surveys. Before I hand it back over to Maria, I would be remiss if I did not thank Marisa Hotchkiss, the author of the report uh, released in 2017, for her endless guidance, patience, and knowledge that she shared with me as I embarked on this project to Dave Raglan, Chase Sawyer, Andres Mojica, and Greg Mills for the, the, for the work they did on machine learning, um, Andrew Reamer for his collaboration and partnership and the leadership uh, of the Census Bureau, Donna Daly, Deb Stampowski, Al Fontano, Ron Jarman, and Director Santos. On a very personal note, I never expected to have such a passion uh, for a project. Um, for, for me, the data came alive. This research uh, is one component of how our data are used. There are countless uses of the data by others who are making data-driven decisions or for a writing a grant, uh, for a, uh, writing a grant for a proposal for a grant. My mom uses our data in writing proposals for the University of Texas at El Paso for funding of various programs benefiting Hispanics and STEM, and my brother who relies on our data for program evaluation. By responding to a Census Bureau survey or census, this better prepares our state or our community with the data needed to ensure they are provided, they are provided the right amount of money to provide assistance. A response is the first stitch that is interlaced across the federal government and various assistance listings. These, assist, these assistance listings are vast, but there seems to be an underlying commonality. The assistance listings benefit all facets of our lives and to the individual and families that need it the most. A prime example is the COVID-19 pandemic. It was never predicted, but our data were the first line of defense in order to get funding to states to begin recovery and relief. Thank you for listening, and I will now pass it back to Maria. Maria? Thank you, Ceci. Um, I have to join Ceci on those words. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Al, Andrew, and for their participation. I have to thank Ceci for such a wonderful presentation, uh, as she has been someone that I have looked up to during my career. Like, uh, we're around the same age, but I'm a little bit more junior in the federal government than Ceci, and I have a lot of admiration and, and consider her one of my mentors. So, Ceci, thank you so much for uh, this presentation. This has been amazing. I know it's how important this is, working with national partners and stakeholders every day. Uh, I see how organizations all around the United States uh, use this data and what a difference this research is going um, to make for so many. Uh, also, as the... As, as, as the resident of an inner city and with kids attending inner city uh, schools, I see also census data alive every single day, just like the example that you gave with your mom and what you did with, with this research and what uh, Dr. Rimmer did with his um, in the past. It's making changes for communities all around the country. So thank you to the three of you for such a wonderful panel. So now um, I would like, uh, I think we are ready for questions, and I would like to ask the operator, like, can you please give the instructions on how people can submit questions again? Yes, thank you. We will now begin the question-answer session. 
If you'd like to ask a question, please press star 1, unmute your phone, and record your name clearly. Your name is required to introduce your question. If you need to withdraw your question, press star 2. Again, to ask a question, please press star 1. It'll take a few moments for the questions to come through. Please stand by. And our first question is from Hanzi Lo Wong from NPR. Go ahead. Your line's open. Thank you. And given how much of a motivator this estimate is for census participation amongst the public based on the Census Bureau's research, why has it taken it almost six years for the Census Bureau to update its estimate of how much of federal funding is guided in part by decennial data programs? So I uh, thank you, Hansi, for the question. Um, so I don't uh, the last report was before the 2020 census. The report before that, the Census Bureau issued, was before the 2010 census. So I think the cadence has typically been uh, prior to a census to have, as you saw in the CBAM uh, data, that that it was a motivator. Um, so. This time around, we've decided, you know, it's it's probably changed, so let's see where the figure is, and, and that's where we are today. So we did the research and, and released the number today. If I could use my follow-up question, just a different line of questioning here. Given um, that the COVID-related relief funding makes up about a quarter of this latest estimate, what is the Bureau's plan for updating this estimate going forward so we have a more accurate um, sense of how much federal funding is guided by census decennial data. Is this a yearly cadence, uh, or is this going to be the only update before 2030? Yeah, uh, thank you, Hanzi. Um, the, uh, we do plan on uh, updating this more frequently. We just have not uh, provide, had it decided internally on the cadence of, of the releases, but we are looking um, into doing this um, more frequently. Thank you. Sure. Next question is from Mike Schneider from Associated Press. Go ahead. Your line's open. Hi. Uh, thanks for having this. Um, I have a question about um, adjustments for the population estimates, so I'm not sure who the best person is to answer that, so I'll let you fight over the question. But um, um, you know, as you know, uh, the blended base uh, was devised as a way to overcome some of the uh, uh, undercounts in the 2020 census and to help with uh, possible shortfalls in federal funding that communities who are overcounted uh, might face. And so I was just wondering if you could talk about uh, whether the Bureau regards it as a success and whether it has fulfilled the goal of making these uh, communities that were undercounted get the federal funding uh, that actually reflect their numbers. And then as an addendum, I was wondering if you could provide an update on the work of uh, BERT, the base evaluation and research team, and how their work may influence uh, future population estimates. Uh oh, silence. No, no, no. I'm on mute. And I was writing down, I was using an old school like way of writing down what you were asking. Um, I don't have, I, I'm not familiar with BERT, so I can't answer your question on that. I would have to look into it. Maybe Andrew is aware of BERT. Um, as far as the POP estimates, um, th that is not my expertise, um, and I would feel more comfortable if someone from the POP estimates program were to, um, to provide an answer to you on that one. I don't know if anyone else uh, from the Census Bureau has anything to add to that. I don't think we have anything to add. However, I know that we have a series of, of webinars and that we will be um, announcing for the next couple of weeks, um, and I can go over the list uh, right now, if you would like. Um, we are having a webinar on POP estimates, uh, a release on POP estimates next week. We are also having um, the survey of income and program participation later this month, and also a release on the household survey. So, so probably those are our products 
that will be more related to the question. And at the time, um, we have everything announced in our, in our website. And I know that if we don't have a specific webinar for them, and right now I'm not familiar if we will, but if we don't, I know that our subject matter experts are always uh, open for specific questions and interactions. Thank you. Next question. Our next question is from Allison Plyer from the Data Center New Orleans. Go ahead, your line's open. Hi, thanks. Um, so, well, thanks to the Census Bureau and and Ceci and Via Rosa and uh, Ross, I'm sorry, and Andrew Reamer for really pioneering this important work. We appreciate it. You know, it it, it strikes me that with 2.8 trillion at stake in one year, that's like an eighth of GDP, and it just underlines, um, you know, the need for the accuracy and fairness in the census data. So, and then, of course, as, as we were just talking about, in the years that don't end in zero, the annual population estimates are a major driver um, of annual federal funding distribution, um, and um, the census director has asked for just $6 million to improve the population estimates, make some of the adjustments um, that we were just hearing about, and that $6 million is like a rounding error, right, in in census budget land, um, and the whole $2 billion, our colleagues say census needs to improve the American Community Survey and prepare for the accurate 2030 census is, is a small investment, too, to ensure all this federal funding is distributed accurately and fairly the way Congress intends. So, so I'm wondering, um, on that note, you know, if you all can provide this analysis for each state, because I think that that um, will help folks really relate more, um, whether they're folks locally or even folks in Congress to, to better understand the importance of the census data for their state. Yeah, thank you uh, for your comments. And um, we have uh, done a little bit of research into the uh, data at a state level. Um, we just have not made uh, plans uh, of, of a further on, on, on that analysis, but it's definitely something that we're looking into. Next question. Our next question is from Jury from the Southeast Asian Resource Action Center. Go ahead, your line's open. Jury, your line might be muted. Can you mute your phone line? Our next question is from Ethan Elbman from the Federal Funds Information for States. Go ahead. Your line's open. Hi there. Can you hear me? Great. Um, yes, we thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Ceci and uh, everyone, for uh, updating this report. Uh, very much of interest to us, uh, and we and uh, we love stuff like this. Um, just a quick question. Um, a, a sort of a technical question, um, but uh, I noticed that you guys have uh, several of these programs uh, listed as being influenced by census data that sort of are uh, assistance to individuals. Um, specifically, I'm thinking about SNAP and Pell Grants, and uh, it's, it was not immediately obvious to me how you were connecting that to census data, so I was wondering if you could... Uh, 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 elaborate on that. Thank you. Jesse, you want to handle that? You want me to? Uh, you can go ahead, um, Andrew. I was trying to pull up the report at the same time. Okay. Um, thanks for your question. The um, one difference between the report I did a few years ago and the current report is that this report includes programs that rely on the Consumer Price Index, which is uh, the national, the nationwide consumer price index. And, and so programs that adjust the poverty thresholds nationwide, irrespective of where you live, are included um, here. And the, um, the development of the consumer price index can be traced back to the decennial census, it, it, from the decennial to pop estimates to the consumer expenditure survey um, to the consumer price index. So... Um, that's why SNAP and um, Pell are, are in there. Actually, school lunch is in there as well. 
Uh, in addition, it actually turns out that for SNAP, there is a, a geography-specific uh, use of census data in that if a community has more than, I think, 10% unemployment, that uh, SNAP recipients get an extra 13 weeks. So um, that is just for communities that qualify. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that's really helpful. Thanks so much. So I want to remind everyone on the line that if uh, you're interested in making any questions, star one will bring you to our operator. I also want to remind everyone that you can find the press kit on our website, census.gov. To find the press kit, look for the news tab at the top on the census homepage, and you will find the press kit there with all the materials that were presented um, today. Operator, I understand that we have another person on queue. Yes, our next question is from Angeline Echeria from NC Counts. Go ahead, your line's open. Hi, can you all hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, my question is related to the way in which incarcerated people are counted in the census. I know that for the most part, the Census Bureau counts them at the site of their incarceration rather than in their home communities. And so I'm wondering what, if any, impact that has on the accuracy of these federal funding allocations. Um, I've heard from different sources that it does have an impact or that it doesn't have an impact, and would just like to hear from you all what, if any, impact you think it might have. Thank you. Jesse, I can handle that if you like. Um, no, I appreciate the question. Uh, uh, keep in mind that um, for certain programs like Medicaid, the lowest level of geography is the state, and so it doesn't really matter where someone lives in the state. Uh, it, it, as a result, wherever a person is counted when they're incarcerated uh, does not affect uh, a state's receipt of, of reimbursement from the federal government. Uh, the second factor is that for most programs, and actually Medicaid is the exception, but for most programs it's based on the account of people who qualify for that program. So, for instance, Title I grants to K-12 school systems is based on each community's share of poor children nationwide. And so, again, wherever a person in jail is counted, uh, is it, that person's not a poor child. So um, it's not going to affect that, that, that count. Uh, it, it really would only affect the allocation of funds for programs at a substate level in which the person incarcerated is somehow counted in the in the distribution of funds for uh, the targets for that for that program and I, I'm not sure you would probably know better than I what what comes to mind but there are many programs for which it, it is not effective okay thank you Thank you. I know that we're getting uh, more um, people on the queue, so as we wait, I would like to know those major releases that I mentioned earlier. Tomorrow, the Census Bureau will release selected population tables and American Indian and Alaskan Native tables based on the 2017 to 2021 American Community Survey five-year estimate. These tables are released approximately every five years and provide an in-depth look at populations beyond those covered in the one- and five-year ACS products. Next week, the Census Bureau will release vintage 2022 population estimates by age, sex, race, and Hispanic origin. And later this month, the Census Bureau will release data from the 2022 Survey of Income and program participation. The survey collects data and measures changes in characteristics like economic well-being, family dynamics, education, assets, health insurance, child care, and food security. And we are set to release data from phase 3.9 of the experimental household poll survey. So look out for all those releases in the next coming days and weeks. And also, if you have questions not related to the ones um, uh, that about this presentation today, um, the media can contact uh, our public information office at pio at census.gov 
CIO at census.gov. Also, our partners and stakeholders always uh, have, uh, as you know, that you have your contacts, your POCs, or even myself at the Office of the Strategic Alliances. So we will welcome questions over there too. At this time, oper operator, if you have any additional uh, questions on the queue. Yes, our next question is from William O'Hare from Count All Kids. Go ahead, your line's open. Thank you. Um, first of all, appreciate the information and the work and the report that was released today by the Census Bureau. I know it uh, took a lot of effort, so I really appreciate it. And I particularly want to say thank you to Andrew Reamer, who has been uh, working this area for more than a decade and almost single-handedly kept this issue on the forefront for stakeholders and advocates uh, working with the Census Bureau over the last decade. And um, so, I, so I really appreciate all the work that's gone into this. My question is about whether there further and what kind of further analysis there might be from the data set you now have in hand. In particular, I'm interested in knowing what data sources are used, what Census Bureau data sources are used for what programs. I have a suspicion, for lack of a better word, that the population estimates program may be the single most important driver of this data. And if that's true, or even close to true, the blended base has enormous importance in terms of uh, the difference it makes between the blended base and the decennial census. So my, my question really is, will the Bureau or will someone else like Andrew be looking at these uh, this data to try and tease out which data sources are used for which programs? Thank you. Andrew, I don't know if you want to take that. I mean, from, from my perspective, um, the we don't tell uh, agencies which how to how to which 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 program to use, correct? So if it's um, sometimes in the legislation, it can be vague, um, but it could be as far as like you know the the use of the most recent population um, from the most recent census or um, so. I, uh, I don't know, Andrew. Do you want to jump in on this one? Uh, yeah, I can a, a bit. Um, so, Bill, it's probably not a very satisfactory answer. He, he, I, clearly, I cannot speak to what the Census Bureau's plans are in terms of creating a matrix of the 353 programs and all the different uh, data sets that Tessie had bulleted in that slide. But I can say that almost every program relies on population estimates and the American Community Survey. So if you took out everything that did not rely on either of those, you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't take out very much. And the reason is because there are very few programs that actually rely directly on the decennial census. You're not going to allocate money in 2027 based on 2020 numbers. You, you, if it's based on population counts, you, you use the annual population estimates. There are a handful of, of exceptions, and they're all teeny. Uh, in addition, the USDA will use uh, decennial numbers for, for very small communities that um, are not covered in the POP estimate. And then secondly, the American Community Survey, which is the characteristics of the population in terms of income and, and poverty, in particular in race, uh, it, well, it's it certainly race, but it, only race and ethnicity and age are collected in the decennial um, and the, the ACS is designed to determine the distribution of characteristics, in other words, the percentages. Uh, but as I said earlier, many pro most programs are based on a community share of the target population. So the ACS will tell you what percentage of kids in, in um, Baltimore are poor, but then you've got to multiply that by the POP estimates numbers to get the number of poor kids. So the uh, programs that rely on the ACS are also very much relying on POP estimates. Um, and, and then going the other way, the ACS is used at, for a portion of POP estimates uh, identifying the number of people who come to this country from another country in the past year. Um, so Bill, uh, you're welcome to follow up. And also I want to say that I probably would not be doing this if it wasn't for Bill, because in 2009, when I came up with the bright idea of doing County for Dollars 2010, Bill found me the money to, um, from the foundation to make that first go at it happen. So, Bill, thank you for your service, too. Thank you. 
And Bill, I also want to take the opportunity um, to, to remind you that there is a webinar next week on the Population Estimates Program, so I do encourage you to attend that webinar. Thank you. I will be there. Great. Thank you, Bill. Um, operator, next. Our next question is from Rosalind Gold from NALO Educational Fund. Go ahead. Your line's open. Great. Uh, well, thank you so much. Um, first of all, thank you so much to uh, everybody at the Bureau who worked on this and has provided us such valuable information. And, Andrew, thank you so very much uh, for your, your commitment and dedication uh, to this analysis. Um, I have two questions. One is, um, will this information be available for lower levels of geography? For example, if we wanted to find out uh, how much uh, money is allocated to a state um, uh, guided by census data and which are the programs for each state or a particular state. Secondly, has the Bureau sort of built an internal infrastructure to update this on a regular basis? Um, this is very powerful information for uh, talking to the community about the value of participating in the decennial census and having updated data uh, when Census 2030 uh, gets closer uh, would be very valuable as well. Thank you so much. Sure, thank you uh, for the question. Um, we, for the, for, for the, the methods and updating the report, um, we, we, we do have, we're using machine learning techniques. Um, we have a base inventory of programs. We use SAM.gov uh, for the inventory of programs where they do have in their annual publication uh, programs that come on every fiscal year and are taken off fiscal year, so it, it may be easier to, um, to, to, to look at the inventory of programs to add or take out programs. Um, we are um, assessing our ability to analyze at a state level and uh, evaluating the uh, resource requirement to um, issue the report more frequently. But we, we, are, we are looking, um, we are exploring the, the state level, um, the state level, uh, the data for, for the states. Thank you. Um, Jessica, sure. if I can follow up. Uh, sure. Hi, Rosalind. Um, thanks for your question. Uh, if, if you think, uh, if, for those of you familiar with the 2010 work that I did, that actually was down to county and the metro level because at that time, the Census Bureau had what was called the Consolidated Federal Funds Report, the CFFR, which took all federal spending, not just, uh, pro and not just financial assistance programs, but actually federal salaries, for instance, and allocated them by county. Um, that got replaced by USA Spending, and USA Spending, uh, 15 years ago, the aspiration was to be able to, to do that. And uh, for those of us involved in this kind of work, uh, it's not there yet. So we cannot go below the state level with any accuracy. Um, where I was able, the CFAVAR was, was terminated because USA Spending, uh, .gov came, came about. Thank you. Thank you. Operator, do we have any other questions on queue? Yes, our last question is from Robert from the University of New Mexico. Go ahead. Your line's open. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you, everybody. Really appreciate the presentation and all the research that went into this. Uh, especially want to thank Andrew and just note how impactful the counting for dollars research was in the lead up to the 2020 census. As many of you know, state and local governments make huge investments in outreach and complete count committees. And I think a large part of that is due to the counting for dollars research. They can see very clearly the impact that it would have on state and local government coffers and return on investment in ensuring the complete count in their, uh, in their constituency. So um, I really appreciate Thank the you for support. My question relates to this increase that we're seeing. So, you know, if you're $675 billion up to $2.8 trillion. And if we look at the programs that were added, the biggest impact is from Medicare and its various parts. So I was hoping, Andrew, you could explain how it is that um, uh, the Senegal Census data is used in the distribution of Medicare dollars. And, and thank you for your comment. And I missed the last four words of your question. Can you repeat that, please? 
just explaining how um, uh, 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 descending offenses data is used in the distribution of Medicare dollars. Uh, Medicare dollars, okay. So not Medicaid, but Medicare. Um, yes. Um, in it, it, Medicare, as you might know, and you can see from the, uh, the charts in, in the report, is actually four separate programs, A, B, C, and D. And A is hospitalization, B is, is physician's offices, C is the private version of, of A and B, uh, Medicare Advantage, and D is prescription drugs. So C and D rely on census geographic data regarding population density to determine what services are required by the providers of Medicare Advantage and, and prescription drug coverage. So, for instance, if you're a prescription drug program in a very sparsely populated community is going to have less you know, demanding requirements than if you're in Brooklyn. Um, and similarly for Medicare Advantage in terms of the CMS uh, uses census data to, to, in a sense, regulate the, the delivery of services um, to recipients of parts C and D. And part A and B, it, it, uh, are, it's a different use of census data. It, the, the reimbursement that goes to hospitals and to physicians' offices is a, is a function of the cost of providing health care in their communities. And and so the census data are used to actually draw the geographic classifications, metropolitan, uh, metropolitan areas, uh, and and a bit on the on the um, the prices side as well. But it's 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 largely you need to know who is living where so to be able to draw the metro areas, and um, and those. Uh, those classifications, which are done by OMB with guidance from census, are then used to determine reimbursement for parts A and, and, and part B. But it, it all is based on people filling out their census form. Thank you. Thank you. I think that was our last question. Oh, I think we have more questions. I'm getting, is, is that correct, operator? We have two more questions. Would you like to take those? Of course. Thank you so much. All right. Our next question is from Jay June from Georgetown Center. Go ahead. Your line's open. Hi. Um, just a quick question. You mentioned the use of uh, national well, machine learning. Uh, just curious, would you consider releasing the, um, the training data that you used? Um, would be of interest, I think, and maybe for folks who want to look at maybe applying it to they looking at the distribution of funds and, and states, or maybe in the uses of legislative or policy or, or legal uses of census data, it might have interesting applications. And so, I'd be very interested to see if you could share that training data too. So it sounded, you know, when I when I talked about machine learning, I, I didn't. I, I relied on the experts to do that. Um, I would have to look into seeing um, if we could if, if we could do that, or if they could. Uh, at, at least explain how they did it. Um, I encourage you to um, um, reach out to the Public Information Office so that we can get you in the, the correct answer if we're even able to provide uh, those techniques. And Jay Jun, if I can follow up, um, thanks for your question. To the extent machine learning was used, it, it identified candidates for Sessie and I to look at, to eyeball. This was all a one by one by one. We looked at every, as I did for 2020 counting for dollars, um, look at every program because every program is different. Every program is dreamed up by somebody other than the Census Bureau. And, and we had to figure out what data are being used because sometimes it's quite specific. It'll say, Congress will say, uh, ACS data shall be used for the following purpose. Other, other times it just says population data, and you've got to figure out what data is being used and then uh, to trace it back to, to the decennial. Um, so uh, yeah. Ceci and I yeah. had lots of fun and bonded mm -hmm. over, what do you think about this program? What do you think about that program? And 
I, yeah, we call them Easter eggs. So sometimes it was really, really easy, and then there were other times where it was a trail of, of, of crumbs, right? So it's like it would take us to one authorization, and you think that you're going to have the answer there, and it would take you to another authorization. So it, it, a lot of the work, um, the machine learning aspect, Andrew's right, it just pulled out um, programs, and then from there I had to go in and look and see, do these programs, um, um, are, they, are they pulling out the right terms? Because um, you could say census, but you have to remember there's also a census of agriculture. So at times mm. the machine learning would pull in census of agriculture, um, so it wasn't a program for inclusion. So it just helped narrow down some of it. From it's, it's a needle in a haystack with all of the various programs that are out there and understanding their authorizations um, and how they're distributing the, data, the, the the funds and if they're using our data. Thank you, Ceci. And also it's there are different haystacks. So yeah, in, that, some that is true. <laughs> in some instances, Congress puts the uh, source of the data and the use of the data in legislation. In other instances, Congress leaves it to the department to put it in regulation. And there's lots of, particularly USDA, all their uses of census data are in the Code of Federal Regulation. And so we had to, we had to go into that. And in, in a lot of instances, it's in neither law or in regulation, it's, it's up to the agency on a year-by-year basis to tell um, grant applicants uh, what the criteria are. So uh, when Ceci showed the, the third bullet of the uses about selection criteria, uh, uh, USDA will say you get five extra points if you're a small community. You're below 5,000 people. But that's their choice. They don't have to do that by law or by regulation. And that can change from year to year. So we had to figure all that out. Thank you. Any other questions? And our next question is from Charles Mann from SC Counts. Go ahead. Your line's open. Thank you very much. Uh, in South Carolina, I'm a local uh, census advocate, and what we try to do is to get people to make sure that they uh, are counted. And one of the things that we are trying to do is to get local representatives, elected, or elected representatives, and nonprofits to understand the importance. One of the things that we are looking at is what does each person represent, each person counted, represent in federal dollars back to a community? Uh, is it as simple as dividing uh, the population by the $2.8 trillion? I know there are probably a lot of factors, but if we can get local people to understand that this count also represents federal allocation in dollars, maybe we can reduce the undercount. So it is uh, uh, nearly impossible to, to put a dollar amount for each response. Um, Andrew and I uh, spoke about this yesterday, and, and I think that, Andrew, if you want to give your, um, sure. uh, your, your answer, um, as, uh, your explanation, I, it opened up my eyes as well because I think it's a, it's a good question, but the answer just brings a lot of clarity as, as to why you can't put a figure on that. It, it, yes, thank you, Ceci, and thanks um, for your question. We were anticipating this, and it's like, where the, how come nobody asked that question? So thank you for, being, for making sure we could respond to it. Um, there are several reasons. One is, if you think about the slide that Ceci showed about the uses of census data to allocate funding, the first is eligibility, which is a yes-no question. I mentioned SNAP, that um, if your community is over 10% of unemployment, you get some extra money for SNAP. But if someone's undercounted, maybe it, it, instead of 12%, you're 11%, but it doesn't change your categorization. If New York City had a 50% undercount, it would still be a major metropolitan area, and, and Medicare uh, Part A would be uh, de determined for New York City accordingly. So there's lots of instances where the, it, it's a yes-no question and missing 10 people or missing 1,000 people is not going to move the needle. A, a, a separate instance, and I mentioned this in the uh, answer to the question about uh, prisons, is that not everybody counts for every program. It's very, very rare for everyone in this webinar to count for a particular program. Medicaid is actually the biggest exception. And highways. 
Um, highway funding doesn't care if you are poor, rich, five or 85. But using my example from uh, the prison question, uh, in South Carolina, it, Title I grants to K-12 school systems is based on the number of poor children in South Carolina. If in your community that South Carolina Council is talking to, no adult f- f- uh, filled out the census form, the community would not lose any – well, I mean, that's not true because they have to fill out the form for their kids. But it, the point is that if you miss adults, it's not going to affect the allocation of funds to kids – and the reverse is true for senior citizens. It's many programs um, uh, are based on a state or a community share of, of senior citizens, and we're at the end of time. I will add one more thing, which did not actually hasn't come up yet. This is a zero. If a community loses money, it does not go back to the treasury. It goes to the other states. So every state, every community has some interest in other places getting undercounted because they get more money. And as people might know, most major states had a get out the count um, effort in 2020 with the exception of Texas, which, which meant that to the extent that Texas was undercounted and the, and the, uh, the post enumeration survey suggested that the estimate was, that money went to other states. And, you know, California got, for every buck that Texas missed, California got 12 cents. That's how it works. So, so may I have a follow-up? So it is estimated that in South Carolina in particular, just to just pick that as a state where, where I am, that we were probably undercounted by 50,000 people. So is it a fair assumption to say that if all of those people were counted, South Carolina would have got, would get a greater allocation of federal funds because it crosses the spectrum of the elderly, the young, and all that, the black and the browns. Is it fair enough to say that if we had truly had an accurate count, that we potentially would have gotten more federal funds allocated, yes. allocated to our yes. state? Yes, yes. And to put it another way, if your aim is to starve your state of funds and let other states have your taxpayer dollars, don't fill out the census. Okay. Thank you. Maria, I think it's back to you. Thank now. you. Yes, I think uh, we are done with questions at this point. As a final note, again, if you have any additional questions after today's webinar, please contact the Public Information Office at BIO at census.gov or call us at 301-763-3030. I would like to thank again today's presenters, Professor Andrew Reamer, Ceci Villarroc, and Al Fontenot. I am Maria Medo Malagon. Thank you for joining us for today's virtual event. Have a great, great rest of your day. Bye. That concludes today's conference. Thank you for participating.